Coming up on Techzilla, Thunderbolt is here, keeping the internet on when the power is out. Android and OS X, they got Trojans, missing Gmail, keeping Firefox old school, Defender versus Security Essentials, and quite a bit more. So heat up that pie and scoop on the ice cream, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by GoToAssist Express. Support smarter with GoToAssist Express. Gamefly. Go to Gamefly.com slash TechZilla for your free trial membership. Host Gator Web Hosting. Web hosting powered completely by Green Energy. Get 25% off your order with the Revision 3 discount. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to TechZilla. Hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner, tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or why the same side of the moon always faces Earth, hmm. 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 We've got an answer for you. And if we don't, we'll track down someone who actually understands astronomy and physics and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like Phil over at Bad Astronomy. Ooh. He's the best. Is it Bad Astronomer or Bad Astronomy? Bad Astronomer. Got it. Thunderbolt, we'll be talking about Intel's new high-speed interface that debuted on the MacBook Pro a little later in the show. Definitely something interesting for Intel, a major new technology starting out on Apple. From the get your stinking hands, in, <laughs> I'm sorry, from the get your damn stinking hands off my new top-level domains department, you know, stuff like .com, .net, .weasel, ICANN has rejected the U.S. Department of Commerce's suggestions that governments be able to veto a generic top-level domain. I wonder if that means .XXX is coming back. Yeah, .XXX, baby. The I, mean, domain I don't know why I'm so be... excited about that. <laughs> Do that again with the hand rubbing. Yes. That was just frightful. I don't know. Are you missing Gmail? I was okay. You were okay. I'm fine with Gmail. It's pretty crazy. Apparently, Google says basically their little announcement, they're working to restore mm -hmm. messages lost by roughly two yes. out of every 10,000 Gmail users. Yeah, though, if you're feeling paranoid, you can enable pop with Gmail and download a copy of all your email to a desktop client, like Thunderbird or Outlook, for example. And if you're one of the people who have already lost that email, uh, you should have done that last week. Mm -hmm. From the watch out where you download your apps department, Symantec says some not very nice people modified an Android app called Steamy Windows with a mm. Trojan that can install, quote, install other applications, monkey with the phone's browser bookmarks, surreptitiously navigate to websites, and silently send text messages. That last one, the text message part, really nasty because they're sending SMS messages to premium rate numbers. Like every time they send an SMS manager, the number or an SMS message to a number, you get charged like two bucks or something. Uh. Yeah. There's a really good write-up on it at Computer World. And please try to download your apps from the Android market since the nasty Trojan version only on third-party sites. Mm. And if you tend to run pirated software, say cracked apps from torrent sites on your OS X machine, you might want to buy some AV software for your Mac, the Black Hole Rat. is It's basically a Trojan that contains a remote access terminal. Its impact looks minimal for now. It's been a lot of whole like, OS X has been hacked. Everyone run from the hills kind of headlines. Uh, but uh, Sophos and other folks are basically saying it's minor now for now but I, I gotta say I think OS 10 is finally getting to the tipping point where there are enough OS 10 users oh, yeah. that the that the, the the hacker type I shouldn't say hackers the, the naughty people mm -hmm. are looking at it as a platform bad to ones exploit. Out there. Yeah well I mean that was always the main issue is that there's just so many Windows <laughs> machines out there that it was easy to, to send a Trojan out there and have it spread like wildfire. Wildfire it was actually worth the effort being right. put into the, the software. With OS 10 it was like alright well there's a lot of people using it but I'm not really going to get the same kind of right. recognition. Well, except for the fact that the first person to really do a widespread <laughs> OS X virus would probably get a heck of a lot of recognition. Assuming they want to be identified and don't simply run their, their bots of destruction from yes. some remote location. And hey, watch out, RIM. The BlackBerry is about to have Android as a competitor for enterprise business. Motorola told InfoWorld they'll be developing enterprise security and management tools for Android, offering new APIs that add the missing security and management capabilities at the OS level, so the entire device can be managed via policies by mobile device management tools. Very interesting. 
Yeah, it's about time that someone else came in there into the enterprise market. Well, I mean, iPhone started to play around with it a little bit, but I, I think Motorola working on Android is a serious challenge to BlackBerry Absolutely. on RIM. Yes, and on the tablet front, PC Mag said Motorola Zoom is built to be modified and that it's already been overclocked to 1.5 gigahertz. iFixit gave major props to Motorola for a case that doesn't require prying tools to open. That's you know, a big none of those, plus. None of those really annoying, like, you got to get in there. You're going to need a spot. You're going to oh, need geez. a scalpel. You're mm -hmm. going to need to to not freak out when you hear that terrible cracking noise because that's what you're supposed to hear. Basically, Motorola made it. Well, it, PC Mag suggests Hackable? Motorola made the zooms. Well, they said they made it easy to open because people are going to want to upgrade the 4G modems oh, on the sweet. zooms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they su yeah, exactly. That's the reason why they're suggesting that it's so easy to open up there. Yeah, this is definitely the opposite of Apple's attempts to totally lock down iOS devices. Um, speaking of which, the iPad 2 announcement took place this week. Patrick went down to the announcement. Let's see if he made it in. All right, Veronica, iPad 2.0. We're outside the event. Pretty cool update. First of all, Steve was there. Steve up on the stage doing his thing, quote, we've been working on this product for a while and I just didn't want to miss today. It's faster, it's thinner, it's lighter. Cameras, gyroscopes, magnets, yes, black and white. Shipping when the device itself ships. AT&T and Verizon, same prices, $499 to $829, depending on whether you go for a plain Wi-Fi or a 3G version. And again, Verizon and AT&T are supported. Uh, Apple A5 CPU, this is pretty interesting. Dual core, they're claiming up to 2X faster, 9X graphics boost. It's a system on a chip that's the core of this. Faster JavaScript in the browser, which should be nice for browsing. No flash, obviously. 8.8 .8 millimeters thin. That's 33% thinner than the original iPad. That's actually thinner than the iPhone 4. Uh, 1.3 pounds down from 1.5. This is really cool if you are into video. 1080p HDMI output mirroring from the iPad. I've also heard a lot of people speculating that a lot of teachers are going to be really excited about this. A lot of people do presentations. Camera, 720p video on the back, VGA video on the front. No specs on the actual resolution on the camera, but let's assume it's going to be 720p. Photo booth, new iMovie for iPad. iOS 4.3 coming out March 11th with the new iPad. Uh, it's going to work on the iPads and, of course, the 3 and 4 versions of the iPhone. The smart cover, right? Really interesting. Leather versions, plastic, like five different color versions, plus a leather version, 39, 69, depending on whether you go plastic or leather. That's what the magnets inside the iPad are for if you automatically line the case, which also functions as a stand. And of course, they talked business. 100 million iPhones in the market, 15 million iPads in 2010, $2 billion paid out to developers. Apple is on the warpath to keep ahead of everybody in the tablet industry. Let's talk to some people about what they thought about the iPad 2.0. You like games? You like gaming hardware? You probably read this man's work, GameSpot.com. Sarju Shah, what did you think of the iPad 2? It looks pretty sweet. Uh, they don't have any games running there that are actually native to what the new processor is. But I'm really excited to see what the 9X performance does. And they, they really managed to avoid any specific, other than dual core and up to 2X faster and 9X faster on graphics, no talks about what they were actually accelerating in terms of the graphics. Yeah, they didn't really say anything, nothing in terms of like OpenGL or like frames per second or even showing off a game that, that benefited. That was, that was actually pretty stunning. Any word from developers? I mean, because it's funny, GDC going on right now down the street. Probably, I haven't heard anything from any developers talking about anything they're going to be able to do on the 2.0. It sounds like they've kept this really under wraps. Big shock for Apple. Yeah, it's actually pretty quiet out there. I, I was actually, randomly, I heard a tweet out there for an, actually an Infinity Blade update, which hopefully shows off some of the new stuff. Any games you're really excited about running on the iPad currently? Angry Birds. <laughs> See, I'm not the only one. One of my favorite tech journalists out there, Lance Yulnoff, PC Magazine, sharing a problem I can relate to. How is he going to convince his wife to let him drop $829 on the iPad 2.0 when you have an iPad 1.0? I'm telling you, it's hard. I, everything I predicted about this thing just about came true. You know, it's thinner. It's got the dual cameras. It's faster, that A5 chip. Uh, and not just the, the speed sort of in general, but nine times faster on the graphics power. So it's going to be better for gaming because I do do some gaming on it. Uh, everything about it makes it more attractive to me than before and they didn't change the price and I remembered saying that that's critical because it's the thing that gets people over that hedge that gets them into the iPad campus that oh well I can get it for 499 right. so 
why get a netbook? I'll get that instead. I'm going to do more, and I can add apps for 99 cents, so I still want it. I think they did a good job. They answered pretty much every question. They didn't increase the resolution, and I remember some people telling me that they couldn't do the retina display because it's too large and mathematically it couldn't happen, but I thought they might go a little bit higher. But you know what? I'm not sure it matters. I, I honestly have this feeling right now in the pit of my stomach that like, oh, I really want it. I touched the thing. It is, it is, you know, it's a, it's one third uh, thinner than the current iPad. It's 1.3 pounds. You feel that different difference. It's also, it's not flexible. You don't feel like, oh my God, I'm going to break this thing. It feels solid, feels good, works just as well as the current one. I do like that they've got those new apps coming because I'll buy those anyway. I'm going to get those from my iPad. The iMovie and GarageBand, I can play guitar and I can make movies of myself playing guitar poorly, but I need those cameras. I do need those cameras. A man whose words I've been reading actually for a really long time. Dude, Andy Inako, you are a legend. You're okay. obviously Mr. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll back off on the fanboy before I freak you out in your run. You've been in, you've been hands-on, and I heard you speaking a second ago. I think you are really big on Apple 2, well, the Apple 2.0, the iPad yeah. 2.0. I'd say so. I mean, if you showed me the specs point for point last week, and I think actually most almost everybody had the specs already in hand, it wouldn't have sounded quite so exciting. It would have sounded like a stopgap measure, but you really feel as though... It's doubly Apple-y. <laughs> it's the familiar iPad you've always seen. And yes, there's a new yes, there's a new camera. Yes, the processor's a lot faster. But when you hold something this thin in your hands and you realize that this thing still has a 10-hour battery, this thing still has a processor that can keep up with nine live video streams at the same time, this is a, still a machine that you really can't trip up, you realize that, oh man, every other tablet manufacturer is in gravy right now. I, 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 are you, then obviously, I think you're joining. I was talking to Lance Yulnoff earlier, and we both like, should have sold the iPad last week. Are you on that list? Uh, probably not. Uh, only because I, I am a journalist in a collapsing market, and so I can't afford to keep buying $800, $800 iPad every single year. Uh, but, you know, probably, be, uh, but then again, I, I am writing a book, so I suppose I should just, uh, out of conscience, get it. If you, I, I would, I, but I would really stack the year that I had of using the iPad against having to wait for the iPad 2, and I'd much rather have that year of using the iPad. But yeah, I think a lot of people who were anywhere near the fence on an iPad, I don't think they're going to wait for all the other releases to come in because Apple just emphatically has said, this is the level of the game that you guys are trying to get into. You should go home now. We'll have more on that next week. Let's fire up the first question and talk about keeping the internet flowing when the power goes down. Chris writes, G'day Texela crew. I remember Patrick and Roger's system tutorial on supplementing a UPS with a car battery. How could I make something similar but just for powering my modem and wireless router? I know I could just plug the wall wards into the UPS, but isn't that a lot of unnecessary conversion from AC to DC and back? Would it be possible to hack together a smaller battery, say something like a cordless drill battery and charger to give me wireless internet when the power goes out? Given the prevalence of laptops and netbooks, I think such a hack would be super useful. Thanks for all the great work, Chris in Ottawa, Ontario. That's actually really good timing on Chris's part because mm -hmm. I got an email last week from uh, Wesley Kadig, one of our viewers. His version of a DIY portable power back pack like we built in the very early days of Texel, literally like the first three or four shows. Um, it was a, a 12 volt, 12 amp hour battery like this, and we we put it in a little Maxpedition case, mm -hmm. and uh, so and and mounted it so we had a little 12 volt cigar lighter socket. Uh, uh, that you could power devices off of. So this idea we'd have like, you know, 75 hours of iPhone life Sweet. or something like that. Um, his is pretty cool. He's got a 12 volt, 12 amp hour battery, a 400 watt AC inverter, and a voltage gauge, very nicely built into a Pelican 1200 case. And he's got the, the you can see on the side picture there that you're looking at right now, you can see where he has the uh, 120 volt sockets from the inverter sticking out the side of the case. It's pretty slick. Here's the thing, right? If your broadband modem and router are consuming, let's call it two amps total, you should get more than four hours, probably less than six hours out of a classic NP12 alarm battery like this before you run out of juice. Um, a little bit longer than that if you're willing to ruin the battery by running the voltage down too low. I used to think 12 volt AC inverters were stupid, right? Because you've got that whole thing there. Why'd it go from DC to AC to DC? Then I did a bunch of testing for a system episode and I was kind of shocked because the inverters are actually really efficient, sometimes just as efficient as running the same, we're literally pulling the same current as running a DC voltage adapter to power the same device. So basically, battery to inverter to, you know, wall wart was literally drawing the same amperage as battery to DC regulator to the device. 
And here's the thing, so if you use an inverter, you don't end up buying a whole set of DC power cables you don't need. A uh, commercial UPS like the one I'm holding here, um, it's pretty slick, right? Some very talented engineers built a magic device with a switch, so if the electricity stops working to here, it goes to the electricity from this battery, it's got a charger built in, it's got an inverter built in. It's simple, it, all right, it's not very portable, but it's kind of nice to not have to deal with charging devices and monitoring the, you're basically like, okay, do I need to have a float charge on this? Is the battery still charged? You know, is the inverter working? working correctly. Um, the cordless drill battery idea, always tempting, right? The DeWalt battery packs, they've got those oh so cool A123 made nanophosphate lithium ion batteries. But frankly, while the amps to weight ratio is awesome, we're talking about two and a half amp hours from a 1.3 pound battery pack. You're talking about 120 bucks to operate your modem and router for about an hour. And that's not counting the cost of a drill or something to crack off all the connectors you'll need to actually use those batteries and still use the original chargers which is why I went with a $25 sealed lead acid battery. Cheap, easy to charge, lots of amps, and won't require days of work and a pile of money to replace. The nine pound weight sucks, but compared to 500 bucks for a raw 12 volt, 12 amp hour lithium ion battery, manager and charger, I'll deal for now. By the way, if you haven't seen it, check out Hypermax 222 watt hour external battery for the MacBook slash iPad slash USB devices. Uh, it's like a 14 and a half volt, six amp hour battery that weighs four and a half pounds, roughly half the weight of my little portable charger battery. It's really, really neat, uh, but it's 450 bucks. And they make a good weapon in a pinch. <laughs> yes, you can hurl these at people really and, and get major hit point lights damage. Out. Yeah, it's like plus 20 on a D20 roll. All right, yes. It's time now to thank one of our sponsors, Go to Assist Express. There are a variety of tools in the market that let you remotely work from another person's computer. But the only one I trust and rely on is Go to Assist Express, brought to you by Citrix. The reason? Exceptional performance, ease of use, and security. No IT maintenance or updating is required. It's so fast, you'll be viewing your client's computer and troubleshooting in seconds. Plus, support clients' computers even when they're away from their computers. Texilla viewers can try Go to Assist Express free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit gotoassist.com slash Texilla. That's gotoassist.com slash Texilla for a free trial. Late last week, Intel introduced Thunderbolt, a new high-speed I.O. interface, here to help us get a better understanding of what Thunderbolt is and what it means to you. Tested.com's Mr. Will Smith. Welcome back, man. Oh, thanks, Patrick. What's going on at Tested.com this week? Well, I mean, this week we're, we're knee-deep in Motorola stuff. We've got the Atrix, which is the new 4G phone for AT&T, right. the Zoom, which is the Verizon slash no one tablet. It's the first honeycomb tablet. And we were talking about that in the in the A block. Uh, uh, people have already figured out how to overclock it. Oh yeah, 50%, somebody like got it to 1.5 gigahertz or something. Mm -hmm. I mean that's crazy. Battery life of like eight minutes at that point. I mean it's battery life seems not so awesome. Stock clocks right now, but I mean yeah. it's 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 interesting to see what Android's take on a tablet is because you, you hold it the other way. I, I, I mean, who would have thought? It's I, crazy. Motorola. Yeah, exactly. Those wild people. Exactly. So let's talk Thunderbolt. We, should we talk about the fact that? Intel is introducing a new technology with Apple, which I think is the most interesting thing about this. Or should we talk about sort of light peak becoming, dumping the optical option, going straight copper? I mean, well, they kind of go together, right? right. I mean, because the, the PC and I assume Apple uh, OEMs, the, the people who make the actual hardware, said, mm -hmm. you know, this optical connector is going to be too expensive for us to put on motherboards because right. it costs more than 18 cents or whatever the, whatever the cutoff is for, for millions of motherboards. So Intel went back to the drawing board with, with Apple. Right and said, let's make this an electrical standard. And I mean, it's kind of an interesting story. It seems like Intel's been rolling out a lot of new technology with mm -hmm. Apple first lately. Which used to not be, I mean, it's kind of like USB was around for years. Oh, yeah. On millions of PCs. 95. Before, yeah, yeah. It was literally on millions and millions and millions of PCs, and there were literally no USB peripherals until the iMac, the gumdrop iMacs oh, yeah. came out, and all of a sudden there was like USB printers and USB this and USB that. Well, it was the only thing you could plug into the iMac, as I recall, right? I mean, there were no other ports. But Steve took this like, you know, at this point, right, Apple was barely alive when these, these, these first generation iMacs came out, and he actually convince some really serious vendors to come out with USB peripherals oh, yeah. just to go along with this. So, so I mean, this is this is a, kind of the same story, but it's mm -hmm. a little different. Because, I mean, this isn't, Light, uh, Light Peak and Thunderbolt aren't, don't seem to me to be really consumer-facing specs. I mean, right. I, I think eventually we'll see consumer, you know, stuff that you or I will buy, you know, RAID arrays and, right. and stored drives and stuff like that. But I think at, at start, I think it's going to be for people who have video and audio studios mm -hmm. and need either really low latency or really high bandwidth. So right. if you're dealing with like uncompressed video, high def video, massive, massive, massive files, right. uh, it's great for that. 
But you're not going to replace. You're not going to have a uh, Light Peak or Thunderbolt USB key, or, or Light which Peak I guess or Thunderbolt wouldn't. printer. Exactly. Right? Well, it's kind of funny, right? Because essentially, it's very similar to USB 3.0 in terms of performance. Mm -hmm. Thunderbolt is faster. Yes. But when you start looking at it from the engineering standpoint, it's essentially moving the PCI Express bus out over something other. Well, it's, it's moving the PCI Express bus outside of the machine. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the neat thing, is the, the Thunderbolt controller basically bottles up a 4x PCI Express channel, and then also some DisplayPort channels. I don't, ex I don't understand exactly how that works. It seems like magic to me. Well, it seems like Apple was desperate to get rid of the DisplayPort, yeah. dot, dot, dot. But it's kind of funny, right? Because you, the, the, you look at the MacBook Pros, right? They still have FireWire. They still have USB oh, yeah. 2.0. They, they ignored USB 3.0. But they added in this weird new port, which will require yet another weird new Apple adapter to get to your monitor. I, I don't think it's Apple that's ignoring USB 3.0. I think it's Intel. Because if you look, there's no native USB 3.0 on any Intel chipsets right now, right. which for a standard that's been out for quite a while, more than, more than a year, I guess, right. I mean, that seems, I, I, th I like to blame Apple for screwing stuff up, <laughs> but I think in this case, it's Intel dragging, the, dragging their feet on implementing USB 3.0 on chip, the chipset side. So the question is, is, is will Intel make it inexpensive for Western Digital and Seagate? Since other than, other than sort of drive vendors, nobody else seems to be doing anything USB 3.0. Uh, I mean, that, that is the big question. I don't know what the IP rights, what, they, what the licensing fees and stuff like that are for USB 3.0 are. I assume it's the same as USB 2, but uh, you know what assuming does. Yeah, <laughs> it gets you into trouble. I mean, outside of a couple probably literally external drive adapters coming out later this year. Have you seen anything using Lightpeak yet? Uh, no, not, nothing. Uh, it seems like Lacy, a, a lot of the big video editing mm -hmm. folks are on board, Avid, um, I assume that Final Cut, I mean, I guess all that stuff will support it because right. there's no nothing to support it. It'll just work <laughs> on the on the OS side. We can hope. Um, but it looks like the audio, mm -hmm. like the heavy duty audio editing people, like I said, eight nanosecond latency even on the electrical connection. I don't understand why that's a good thing, but when I told it to musician friends, they were really stoked about it. it it means there's no delay. Right, right. <laughs> so, so um, the other thing that's neat is it's backwards compatible with DisplayPort. So uh, this is a daisy chain standard, kind of like FireWire. You, you connect one device into the Mac or PC when there's adapters available, another device into the first device, another device into the third device, so on, so on, so on, down until you get eight devices. Just like FireWire. Just like FireWire. Except more limited. <laughs> well, <laughs> FireWire doesn't give you a direct connection to the PCI Express bus. True. Which is, I mean, that's pretty sexy when I, when I look at it. I mean. Is there a possibility that we'll see external video cards using right. a derivative of this down the road? I, I kind of don't, don't uh, I I'm, wouldn't be surprised to see that. Yeah, it, they, they won't be maybe the top performing external video cards, no, but certainly no. something that will kick the ass out of the stuff that's on the motherboard of your portable device, well, of, your, of your MacBook. Or those big render engines, you know, if you say you're at CES or whatever, you have a whole bunch of video to, to encode really quickly. Grab something with a whole bunch of GPUs or a bunch of little CPUs in there, mm -hmm. feed your video into that and it comes out in an hour instead of, or, uh, 10 minutes instead of three hours. So this is a classic new technology debut. Really, really fascinating oh, specs. Yeah. Tons of potential. Yes. Not much you can do with it now. You can plug a DisplayPort a, a monitor into it if right now. If you have a DisplayPort monitor. If you have a DisplayPort monitor. So basically, if you already have an Apple yeah. monitor, you can plug yeah. your MacBook. I think Pro there's some Dells it. out there too. But, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 not something that's going to set the world on fire tomorrow. Dude. Maybe the day after. <laughs> <laughs> Will Smith, Tested.com is a website. Go check it out. They got a bunch of good stuff, including, well, I, I'm not going to mention that video. You mention it every time we're here. I do. You know why? Because everybody should see what a flip camera looks like. <laughs> Wrapped in a condom, and you can find it at Tested.com. Coming up next, well, we got viewer questions for you, but first, let's thank one of our sponsors, Gamefly.com. If you ain't seen it, it's the largest video game rental service on the internet. We're talking about 7,000 new and classic titles across all consoles and handhelds and plans. Starting just $15.95 a month, that means you can rent one to four games at a time, keep them for as long as you like, no late fees, no due dates, take forever to finish playing Zelda, they don't care. And you know what, shipping's always free to your house, and when you're done, put the game in the envelope, send it back, Gamefly is gonna send you the next available game on your list. If you really like the game you're playing, just click keep it on the Gamefly website, and the game is yours at a discounted price, and Gamefly is even gonna mail you the case and manuals free of charge. If you're a gamer, you should check this out. And because you're a Techzilla fan, we got you a free 15-day trial. Just go to Gamefly.com slash Techzilla. Gamefly.com slash Techzilla. Score a free trial and get all the games you're great. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Wordspy.com. 
Recently, the words jazz hands and sexting were officially added to the Oxford Dictionary. And it just goes to show that if you can say something enough times, well, eventually it could become an actual legit word. To discover more potentially awesome and maybe dictionary-bound words, head over to www.wordspy.com. Word lovers will either squeal with glee or cringe in agony over some of these new concoctions, such as Manther, noun, a middle-aged man who seeks sexual or romantic relationships with significantly younger women. Or take, for example, the slightly derogatory sounding gutter bunny, which simply means someone who rides their bike to and from work every day. You can search for words alphabetically or take a look at the top 100 words in their master list. WordSpy is kind of like Urban Dictionary, except with a lot less raunchy content. You can also search by category to find the perfect buzzword for your next blog post or article. Check out WordSpy.com today, and thanks to Twitter user MonkeyStick for the suggestion. Yeah, if I call my wife a gutter bunny, I'm going to get slapped. <laughs> Good old monkey stick. Monkey stick. Rob shot us an email asking, Yo, Patrick and Veronica, and now Robert, what's the difference between Windows Defender and Windows Security Essentials on Windows 7? If you have a program like Avira or AVG installed, can you shut off the Windows stuff and just use the installed purchase program without annoying Windows updates? asks Rob in Vermont. Yeah, they're a little bit on the redundant side. So Windows Defender is primarily used to protect against spyware, um, but doesn't have any kind of antivirus protection built right in. So if you're seeing a lot of pop-up windows or your settings have gone all askew, uh, then using Windows Defender is a good way to suss out any spyware situations on your Windows machine. Windows Security Essentials, on the other hand, is the whole shebang. Virus protection, malware, spyware, etc. It will scan and notify you of any situations as they occur. If you're using this, though, you won't need to run Windows Defender at all, and actually I've heard that using both of them at the same time can cause some pretty funky problems on your machine. Yeah, I would say if you're running Windows Defender, you know, install Windows Security Essentials and then get rid of Windows Defender. Yeah. That's just me. Just turn it off, yeah. yeah. Um, however, if you really like the virus protection you're currently using, like AVG or Avira, you can uninstall um, Windows Security Essentials using Add Remove <laughs> Programs from Control Panel, and if you ever want it back, though, it's totally free. You just have to have yeah. a verified, like, Windows, you know, install on your machine for it to work. Yeah, and Windows doesn't care what antivirus or spyware you're using, it just wants you to have one running. Yes. So. Yeah, and if you want to turn off the live monitoring from WSE, you can turn that option off in the settings menu under real-time protection. Um, and if you hate notifications in general, you can turn them all on or off by doing this. Open up Security Center by clicking the Start button, clicking Control Panel, then go to Security, and then click Security Center. Type in your password. Then in the left pane, click Change the way Security Center alerts me. Click the alert option you're looking for and then type in your password again and you're all done. No more annoying notifications. I need to do this myself actually on my Windows 7 machine at home. Where are you going that you're getting all of these notifications or what are you downloading? I just get freaking firewall notifications mm -hmm. all the time on my machine for example. Really? It's like you are not secured by a firewall. I'm like yes. I just... Why aren't you secured Actually by a firewall? I, I think I am but I think I've turned <laughs> off the firewall. I've turned off something. There's something going on. It hates me. I'm it annoys saying, me all the time. I understand where you're coming from. Before you turn off the notifications, make sure you've fixed whatever is pissing it off. Don't you lecture off. me. I'm not lecturing Don't you. you. Lecture I'm lecturing me. them. I know. Carla. Yeah, OK. So Carla <laughs> writes in with this problem. Firefox 4 is coming out soon. And while we're all looking forward to increased speed and other improvements, the minimalist Chrome-like interface is not welcome to some of us. I use Chrome sometimes, but its GUI slows down my workflow. You have to press a little wrench button in the upper right corner to access all the menu items. You can't even have the Google toolbar in Google's own browser. It may not sound like much trouble, but having to press two buttons instead of one 50 or more times a day adds up. Someday within the next few weeks, I'll open Firefox and my menu and toolbar will be gone. Please tell me Firefox, the queen of customization, will let me get them back. The minimalist aesthetic may be pretty, but it makes everything I do take longer. I don't want it. All right, well, never fear. You can definitely restore your menu toolbar with a small click of the mouse. I know it's one more to add to your routine, but it's just once. You don't have to worry about it again. Um, select the new Firefox button, scroll down to Customize, and then select Menu Bar so it's now checked. And by the way, this only you're only going to see that Firefox button right now if you have Windows 7 or, um, or Windows Vista. It doesn't show up in the Mac installs or earlier versions of Firefox. I, I got so frustrated. I'm sorry, earlier versions of Windows, not Firefox. I got so frustrated with Firefox sucking up so much in the way of system resources with the memory leak, I just let well, go of it. Well, I think some of this is supposed to get fixed in the in the final version of four. I will I will try 
once it's out, I will try four again and see if Firefox can win me back from Chrome. Yes, <laughs> and Carla, as you say, uh, Firefox is the queen of customization, and there are already all types of add-ons and changes you can make to the About colon config uh, to make Firefox look the way you want in the beta. TechSpot.com has a great article on making some valuable tweaks to the interface, um, including moving and disabling that Firefox button up there. You can also download and try Firefox 4 UI Fixer at addons.mozilla.org. It allows you to, in their words, move status bar icons to any location, use movable Firefox menu button, which puts Firefox menu button in toolbar button so you can move it wherever you want, display page title in title bar while using Firefox menu button, add new tab option to tab context menu. New tab option? Add new tab option to context menu. Well, I hope this helps. I know it can be frustrating when the browser you've been using for a long time suddenly makes a big UI change and yeah, suddenly you have to kind of, system. or the operating system. Or Word. Things change, the world changes, and then we just kind of have to go along with it, I guess. Except when we tell you how to avoid making the changes. That, yes. <laughs> It's time now to thank one of our sponsors, HostGator. Looking for a place to launch your blog or website? Frustrated with customer support at your current hosting provider? Go with HostGator and get up and running in minutes. With plans starting at just $4.95 a month, you get top-rated 24-7 customer support, access to tools including a website builder with over 4,000 templates, and HostGator will even migrate your current site for free. Servers are 130% powered by wind energy. It's completely green web hosting. You get unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, and a 45-day money-back guarantee. Plus, on top of all of that, you get $100 worth of Google AdWords credit to market your website. Right now, for Revision 3 viewers, HostGator is offering 25% off your order or your first month free. Just go to www.hostgator.com and enter the code TEXILLAHD at checkout to get your discount. That's Texilla HD. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like you to represent Techzilla and Revision 3. You don't need a graduate degree from an Ivy League school to be a Revision 3 ambassador. Nope. If no fancy wanna, family connections. No fancy family connections. No, no big no. pot of money that you can carry into the office, although that yeah, would be yeah, nice. Yeah. No, actually, yeah, well, we're not even going to. Veronica's ambitions of having you walk in with piles of money to become a Revision 3 ambassador. No, if you want to help announce new show launches, partner news and events, control the swag at meetups and more, score sneak peeks, frontline access for live shows, and get your very own custom who knows what from our marketing department. We're talking about getting in the door at what the marketing maven here calls one of the hottest companies in online TV. You want in? You should go to revision3.com slash street team right away, sign up, and get involved. Be the rep in your community for Revision 3. I learned that swag means stuff we all get. Really? Apparently that's what it means. I don't remember where I saw that. It was somewhere recently. You gotta go to Snopes.com yeah. and see if that's, that's true. <laughs> All right, well, Snopes finally. Snopes knows everything. It does know everything, yeah. Finally, we get this question in from Manny in Toronto. He writes, I've noticed that my music and movie collection is growing and it's taking up the space in my room. Hundreds of CDs and DVDs. I've been backing up data on DVDs for over five years now and my backups, along with the originals, are really taking up some space. No kidding. So I'm trying to decide on a good external backup hard disk as this is the most affordable and logical path I could take. My question is, what would you guys suggest as an external hard drive storage solution? 2.5 inches or 3.5 inches? What And what brand is good enough to last me the next five years? I'm leaning more towards 2.5s as they only require two USB plugs and a 3.5 needs an external power source. Manny in Toronto. Oh boy. So we've been talking a lot lately about, you know, what, how long will data last in USB thumb drives? Okay, I've got a 250 gigabyte monthly cap. How do I back up two terabytes of data? Um, you know, because obviously all of a sudden the online backup sites aren't so good when you're talking about terabytes of data and you've got a, it takes a cap so that's. Long. A quarter or an eighth of that. It takes so long. Uh, and, and I gotta say, a lot of people who deal with hard drives do not consider them the ideal way to archive data. When I say archive, it's a big, you know, backing up data. If I'm backing up data like every week or every month, no mm -hmm. big deal. If I'm archiving data, like I'm taking a bunch of drives with the data and I'm putting them in the fire safe or I'm taking them over to Veronica's or Rob's house because they don't live in my neighborhood and therefore both of our houses shouldn't be destroyed in the next earthquake. You know, if you're talking about years, Dumping data on a hard drive might not be so good because it's a magnetic charge, it'll fade over time. Mm. 
So then you get into sort of just, you know, storage devices that are yeah. designed for long-term storage of data. Yeah, something like Drobo would probably be good for your case. Um, it's, it's really designed for tasks like this. Um, alternatively, you can look at external devices that support multiple RAID types, including RAID 5 and RAID 10, a striped array between two or more mirror devices where you can rebuild after replacing a failed drive, which is really nice. Also, go with 3.5 drives. Uh, they're cheaper per gigabyte and with an external drive array that will need an external power source anyway. Yeah, I, the, one of the things about the Drobo is is the, the the later versions of that are actually the software is basically doing what they call data scrubbing. So they're kind of going over your data and making sure the charge mm -hmm. isn't fading over time for extended periods of time. Um, it's 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 really frustrating, right? I, ideally, we should be able to put terabytes and terabytes of data online. Uh, and yeah, you can kind of like FedEx disks to to Jungle Disk or something like that. But the cost for that gets prohibitive. Um, it's 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 and frustrating. It's just, it takes a really long time. To yeah. <laughs> and if you ever make a change to any of the folders you want it to be to be uploading for for storage, then it gets a little. It bit. starts all over again. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. We'll talk more about that later. Drobo. There's a bunch of competitors out there for RAID devices. I'm curious what you guys are using. Um, please don't send us suggestions for like you know, zero slash one type RAIDs, because essentially they're the same hard drive, but if you're using sort of a RAID 5 device or more sophisticated uh, uh, network attached storage box, I'd love to hear what you're using and what you think of it. Exilla at revision3.com is the email for that. Yes. Oh, and Yanni. Yes, Yanni. Yanni or Yanis? Yanni. Yanni in Chicago has a video question for us. Hello, Patrick and Veronica and Robert. Uh, my name is Yanis and I wanted to ask you, I recently bought a smartphone and I love it, but I have all these old PDAs around home and I wanted to know if you know, have a good idea of what to do besides using them as huge MP3 players. Uh, thank you and love the show. I like his shirt. He has a sword and laser shirt. I don't know if you very stylish. If you noticed. What about anything to do to influence his selection? Swordandlaser.com. Check it out. Well, Yanni, outside of a paperweight and alarm clock, uh, we're kind of empty on suggestions. You can recycle them. Yes. Um, you could. I'm sure there's got to be an awesome way that you could hack those things, and our audience probably has a few <laughs> good ideas. Um, so anyone out there watching, please send any suggestions you may have for Yanni on what he can do with some old but still very functional PDAs. Email us, texilla at revision3.com, with your suggestions. And even if you don't have a suggestion for Yanni, you can still email us with all your tech questions, product review requests, how-tos you ask us. But we'll, if you want us to do stuff, please guide us. Send us an email. Yes. Or better yet, send us in a video question like Yanni. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Extra points for sword and laser shirts. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. Facebook.com slash Techzilla, YouTube.com slash Tech8Z, and Tech8Z? TechHD. TechHD. <laughs> at YouTube.com, and of course, at Techzilla. Yep, thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Bye.